and we can start with the first slide. Okay, well, let me just introduce you first. I want, oh, yes, to say, <laughs> <laughs> I want to say welcome to the second in this new series of seminars that are sponsored by UJ History. Um, and I'm Tembi Sawachan, and I'm delighted to introduce today's speaker, uh, Dr. Pranisha Badasi of the History Department at Vitz University. Dr. Badasi's research, as you will hear today, is focused on colonial Natal and the medical and legal histories of infanticide and abortion, among other topics. I want to mention also that she's the editor of the South African Historical Journal, or one of the editors, and the executive secretary of the Southern African Historical Association. So uh, Dr. Badasi is someone you will definitely get to know uh, when you hit the conference and publishing circuit. <laughs> But I think that most importantly, from our point of view, Dr. Padasi is a longtime friend of the UJ History Department. Um, but it's been a while, uh, Pranisha, since we've been able to host you for a seminar. So it's really mm -hmm. wonderful to have you back in this forum. Thank you. I'm going to uh, share my screen. And... I will turn it over to you. I'm also going to turn off my video Perfect. and ask everyone except for Pranisha to turn off their video and to mute yourself. Okay, all right. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Timbisa, for that very lovely introduction. Um, I just want to exit. There we go. So I can see my presentation. Um, this is an absolute privilege uh, to be able to just be discussing my research. It's not something uh, we as historians get to do every day. And so I feel very lucky and very privileged to be able to doing this. So thank you very much for having me. Um, yeah, and here's my, so let's go. The brief uh, for today's presentation was to focus on my journey as a historian. And you'll see that I've decided to speak to you today about the four leaf clover, an archival story about, well, a story about archival fortuity. So let's start about 19 years ago. Um, I developed what I'd like to call and to steal a phrase from Derrida, archive fever. I know there are, I know there are a few eye rolls when I'm saying this, uh, but I'm using the phrase very much in its literal sense. So why archive fever? I'd like to think of myself as a social historian of Lakely and Southern Africa. And when people ask me what I write about and what my research is about, I very cheekily say that, um, I, well, I research my namesake, and that is badass woman. Uh, but there's a long story to this, right? And that's always not been the case for my research. So in the next couple slides, I'm going to offer up a brief overview of my journey as a historian. Um, I first visited the Peter Maritzburg archives in Kuzum Natal, which is really the home of my research, while doing research for my honours dissertation. Uh, myself and uh, Dr. Sparks, Ian Sparks, were honours students at the time. We were under the supervision of Jeff Guy, who's probably the most renowned and uh, cantankerous historian of that time period, but he was the best supervisor and one of one of the best historians of that generation. We're very lucky to have him as supervisors. And since that time, as, um, as early, very, uh, I suppose, wide-eyed uh, honors students, we started, well, I especially started developing and nurturing this relationship with the archives that has over the years been very challenging. It's been very frustrating, but at the same time, immensely rewarding. And without a doubt, I would say that research, I think, and maybe I speak for a lot of historians when I say this, is absolutely my favorite thing about being a historian. And today I've titled my talk, The Four-Leafed Clover, a story about archival fortuity. And I've done this for two reasons. So the first relates um, to the actual four-leaf clover you see on this first slide, which I'll come to a bit later. I'll speak about it in better detail. And the second reason I think is to capture the serendipitous nature of this relationship with the archives and my experience with the archives. The four-leaf clover, as most of you know, is a symbol of luck, right? The first leaf was supposed to represent hope. Uh, the second stands for faith. 
the third is for love, and the fourth was supposed to bring luck to the finder. And so in its very essence, I think all of these things acutely describe what archival research entails. And I think this will become more evident as you relate to my historian's journey and as you as honors students or early PhD students embark on your own research going forward. Um, I think also some Irish folk uh, also say that the four leaf clover grants you the power to see fairies, uh, but I can say without a doubt that in all my years in the archives, I never encountered fairies of any sort. So Timisa, if we can move to the next slide, please. Okay. Oh, that, that. Okay, there we go. So. In essence, um, I'm going to be talking about my honors research, my MA research, my PhD research, and my current research. And my PhD project really started in 2002 when I was an honors student. I was working on my thesis project at this time, which investigated the lives of Indian interpreters in the colony of Natal during the period 1880 to 1910. These interpreters, um, acted as intermediaries between the colonial state and the wider Indian population. These men, and mainly men, only men, occupied a very ambiguous and liminal position uh, in the colonial state because in some ways they were regarded as pioneering figures in overcoming the shackles of indenture, but at the same time they were very much active agents in the perpetuation of colonial oppression and these hegemonic imperial ideas that were circulating at the time. So while researching one of the interpreters specifically who was named Chilevin Stephen, Stephen was his uh, last name, I stumbled upon this crumbly old handwritten letter in what I believe is actually Marathi Hindi script, I found this letter uncatalogued, and this was the key, it was uncatalogued in the files of the Attorney General's office. So you probably don't know this, but the Attorney General's office was responsible for fielding all the queries as well as collating and collecting evidence that was used in the criminal and civil cases that were tried before the magistrate's courts, the district's courts, and the Supreme Court. So I found this letter and as any well-meaning curious historian knows, dusty envelopes are sometimes and well almost always reveal the greatest treasures. So in the envelope I found this letter. It turned out, as you will read from the very short translated excerpt, uh, my dearest son, Sheikh Ramtmaya, I'm sorry to hear from your letters that there had been a quarrel between yourself and your mistress and that you are going to another place to work. We are troubled in mind since we heard of it, for you have not written some time back, that your mistress was very kind and like your mother. So that was quite important, that last bit of the extract. So it turned out that this letter sent by Sheikh Ramtumai's father to him, his father was in India, to him in Natal, was actually used as evidence in the criminal case against Sheikh Ramtumai, who was accused of murdering his mistress, and that Stephen, he actually murdered her by stabbing her, and that Stephen was in fact responsible for acting as the interpreter and the translator in this case. And it was in this moment, while I was doing my honors project, that I in fact started thinking about how this particular case would work for a master's project. And so the idea for my MA dissertation was born. And in that, I decided to investigate capital crimes committed by Indian domestic servants against their masters and mistresses. And the research for this pro project required me to work quite extensively with the records of the Supreme Court and the attorney general file. And one day while I was doing research, it was in the first year of my master's, I think. And of course, as any archival day went back in the day, I was suitably distracted by all the volumes that I was ordering and receiving. And as one usually does in the archives, I stumbled upon this next, um, the next, well, what you'll see in the next image. So if we can please move to the next slide, Tempi, sir. Okay, so yeah. <laughs> no, go, the one with the leaves on it. 
There we go. Okay, perfect. So I stumbled upon this. So intrigued, I was looking at a specific court case about Sheikh Ramtamaya and intrigued by the uneven spaces uh, between, so there was quite a thick volume and there were uneven pages and one of the volumes of the Attorney General's file, I opened up to the section uh, where there was a huge space between the pages and I found it this faded manila, it was a DL sized envelope and it was nestled very tightly in this bound volume of letters, uh, there were minute papers, there were case files and general correspondence of the Attorney General. On opening this envelope, not only did tiny fragments of dust and particles uh, fall onto my lap, onto my clothing, onto the spaces of the keys on my laptop, but out came these obscure bits and pieces of dried blades of grass. So I pulled it out, held it to the light and showed it to my two very good colleagues who were with me at the, with me in the archives at the time, my archive buddies. And while it's not unusual for the records of the Attorney General's office to contain objects such as diaries and photographs, keys, maps, uh, private letters. I once found a key in the shape of a heart, which I was absolutely enamored by, uh, clots um, of various sh shapes, textures and sizes, uh, maps of different kinds, and all of these kinds of artifacts were used as evidence, as I said, in civil and criminal court cases. But this envelope containing dried blades of grass was somewhat unusual and out of place. So, of course, I had to investigate and see what it was all about. And closer inspection, the case file revealed that a woman named Rosaline had been charged with concealing the birth of her child and that she had allegedly used these blades of grass, which were now a hundred, well, yeah, about 114 years old, to strangle her baby. And it was from this startling revelation that my doctoral dissertation and my PhD began with the dusty case file of a woman named Rosaline and these, and these very thin fragments of blades of grass. So I finished the masters and two years later, I began archival work on my PhD proper and conceptualized the project. So this thesis, the PhD project analyzed the designation of infanticide and the concealment of birth, so concealing your pregnancy as a crime within this imperial context of Natal and Southern Africa between the years 1880 and 1935. So very much in the colonial period and up to unionization. So this study really argued that the social, cultural and legal anxieties associated with the crime of infanticide and concealment of birth was obviously multi-layered and complex. It begins roughly uh, in 1846 when the Ordinance 22 of 1846 was passed. It was labeled for punishing the concealment of birth of children within the district of Natal. It is the first such ordinance that's passed relating to the crime of concealment of birth. It was adopted and then the thesis closes in 1935 with the passage of the General Law Amendment Act of South Africa, in which it revised the rules of procedure and evidence for infanticide and concealment of birth criminal cases. In Natal, as elsewhere, so discourses around the definition of infanticide developed with three main foci, so medical, moral, and legal. And this study analyzes infanticide as a crime by carefully tracing the gendered and racial aspects of what had been proclaimed a criminal offense by the mid 19th century, not only in Natal, but for much of empire and definitely in Southern Africa. And the thesis entails a contextualization and analysis of a series of narratives, mainly found in these state records, in the archives, of individuals' lives who really came to be dominated by these crimes, right? They enter the archival record because they've committed a crime, allegedly. From these histories, it is possible to imagine the lives of everyday men and women, but as well as able to be able to construct a view of the way in which Natal colonial and early South African state authorities operated. 
And so some of the key themes that the study covers are the ways in which legislation changed after this first ordinance in 1846 was passed, the problems posed to medical jurisprudence in trying to prove a separate existence of an infant to its mother, which is absolutely key to proving infanticide cases, and whether the matter of a live birth had occurred, right, to obviously rule out stillbirths. And all of this needed to be determined before a conviction could be proffered. Other arguments in the thesis relate to debates about the instability of womb and how medical legal views about the mental state of women accused of this crime may have influenced convictions. Uh, other avenues explored in the chapters argues that such issues as the practice of baby farming, where women especially farmed out their babies to the care of other women for a price sum, there were concerns about infant life protection, um, also growing concerns about racialized and gendered respectability were all integral to this PhD. So while a study of this kind might not appear to be of central importance to the historiography of Natal and South Africa during this time, since it's only a relatively small number of records on the actual reported incidents of infanticide and concealment of birth. I think micro histories such as these that are typically of marginal everyday men and women, they reveal a particular historical narrative and that's important I think and that would be very difficult to arrive at through other avenues. So these men and women, uh, like I always say, they were not crushed by the past, they lived through it, they created it, and it's through the archives that their stories resonate in the present. There's much that we can glean from this. And the fact that the records about marginal characters such as these are to be found in the archive and the irrepressible way in which they have forced themselves through the dust, through the pages, through the cracks, suggest that they attracted the attention of colonial authorities and the bureaucracy for a reason, and for this alone, they cannot be ignored, specifically the Leighton family. Stimbisa, if we can please move to the next slide. So the Leighton family, uh, some of you who know my research know the Leighton family well. I first encountered the Leighton case uh, while working with newspaper records, in fact, not even in the archives. It was, uh, I was in the library and working with newspaper records. This newspaper article was entitled, How the Leightons Were Arrested, with the subtitle alleged infanticide. And by this stage of the research, I was in the final days of archival research and I was somewhat stunned that I had not in fact found the court case in the archives, especially since it was presented as such a high profile case in the media and by newspaper outlets. After various searches on the NAIRS system, maybe you've already been introduced to the NAIRS database, which is our online um, search catalog for the National Archives, there was still no record of the Leighton family or the Leightons, either the father or the two daughters, as you see in the picture, except for a file titled Renard Robinson and Company regarding Rex versus Leighton and his daughters for murder. So excited about the thought that this file would house the transcript of the court of the court script. Timmy, see me just hold on for me one sec. Okay, I'm back. Sorry. I just needed to tell them to switch the vacuum cleaner off <laughs> as is so typical of Zoom presentations these days. Okay, so the Leighton family. Uh, so, Renard and Co. Uh, regarding the case of Rex versus Leighton and his daughters uh, for murder. So, excited by the thought that this file would house the transcript of the court case, I was completely dismayed to find that it was merely a one-page missive from the Durban-based attorney firm Renard Robinson & Co. to the Attorney General's office, simply pleading with them to provide some sort of compensation for their client, Edward Layton, who you see pictured um, next to his daughters on the rickshaw, 
and uh, for him to be constant, uh, compensated in some way for the client who had lost all his work and his money because of the arrest and was now basically living on charity. So after much exploration through various indexes and registered, so the indexes of the Attorney General Office and the registers of the Supreme Court, I finally found the case. The Leighton family had obviously found a way of forcing themselves into the archive. And I was happily, very happily to have stumbled upon it. So anxious to have a souvenir of his visit to Durban with his daughters, in the summer of 1908, Edward Leighton commissioned John Munro of the Beach Photographic Studio to capture this image of himself and his, and his daughters on a rickshaw. The photograph was captured on the 28th of January 1908 and together with various other items of clothing, a blanket, copies of newspapers and a sack, which was actually key to the case, all of these were used as evidence in this against Be Edward, the father, Rose Bessie, marked X in the picture, as you can see, and Ruby May Layton, all three who had been charged with the crime of, infan of, of murder, but in fact, it was a case of infanticide. So to summarize what had happened, Rose Bessie was 19 at the time, Ruby May was 17, they had traveled from Melbourne to meet their father in Durban, Edward. They stayed the night at the Fern Villa Private Hotel in Durban and then traveled to Pretoria the next morning where the father worked for the Central South African Railways. On checking out at the hotel, Leighton was informed that he had to pay five pounds extra for soiled sheets that the hotel had found in the room that his daughters had shared. Unperturbed by this, obviously, Leighton paid the fee and then departed to the train station with his daughters. But then, about 10 days later, members of the CID or the Criminal Investigation Department visited the railway workshop where Leighton worked and he was arrested. It had been uncovered that during the train journey between Durban and Pretoria on the 9th of the 29th of January, the body of a dead baby had been found by a plate layer on the ground near the tra uh, train lines. And after piecing various bits of evidence and testimony together, detectives from the CID concluded that possible suspects in this case were the Leighton family. So a court case ensued and despite the overwhelming evidence presented at the trial pointing to their cul culpability, the Leighton family was actually acquitted. So this case was important for the study because it provided us, or me especially, with the means of commenting on the legal processes and procedures and investigative methods used in criminal cases in Natal during this time. And it also sheds further light on public participation and interest in this case, of, of uh, an interest in this case, specifically of the nature, the scandalous, violent, but also in involving white settlers. It hints at the role of media sensationalism that may have played in the eventual verdict decided upon in such cases. So it was so interesting because my research for this case not came mainly from the criminal court records, but actually from newspaper sources. And it was the newspapers heavily reported on this case, specifically because of its scandalous nature. So for this presentation, I think the case is illustrative about the manner in which archival research is really about looking for clues, piecing together bits of information to write some sort of comprehensive or relative history. So as with other methodological approaches to historical research, there are many implications for using archival and uh, especially colonial archives. We, I think you've been already reading some of this in your theory courses. Archival records are themselves marked by silences, by biases and incompleteness, but the archives and the documentary evidence contained therein do suppose offer some hope. Right. So uh, another historian who writes quite um, prolifically on archives, Nigel Penn, he says, nowhere else are the voices of the oppressed and the vanquished distorted 
though they might be heard so clearly. So the architecture then of social life that archival documents help the historian reconstruct is one that includes individuals that would otherwise be silenced and left out of the grand narrative of the history of early South Africa, even micro histories such as this. So taking into account the processes by, whereby these testimonies and depositions present in the archives were produced, it remains then the challenge of the historian to carefully wipe a, away and then to understand the context and conventions of these stories from the archives before including them in historical narratives. Combing through the court cases and depositions offers really only glimpses into what these individuals thought about their lives and their situations as exemplified by the Leightons and some of the other people I've researched. The individual depositions, letters, diaries available in state and personal archives and collections are interesting for a number of reasons and open us up to an array of debates about matters that were crucial at the time relating to interpersonal relations, familial relations, labor relations, the blurring of gender, more so race and class boundaries, as well as interracial interactions in the colonies at the time. And they offer very generous, I think, descriptions of everyday life experiences, interactions, and something that is really quite hard to read into the archives, and that's emotions. But it's evident how from seemingly unimportant social contexts, we can gain access to the social histories of the very intimate aspects of colonial life. In this picture, for instance, the relationship between the father and his daughters, etc. By analyzing these lived experience of individuals and families, it's possible to gain this glimpse into crucial historical questions relating to the general situation of the private and intimate space of everyday life in the colonies. The archive then becomes this vehicle for historical memory and for sustaining historical continuity across boundaries of time and space. So if we can please move to the next slide. Right, so one of the questions you may have for me now is well, where, what happened to your PhD research and where did it go to from then? And so one project that I've dedicated as much time as I can to is this set of photographs. My paper now that I'm, one of the projects that I'm working on now, uh, focuses specifically on the set of images, but this paper has been about 13 years in the making or so. And even though it's been more than, make, uh, more than a decade in the making, I actually still don't have a paper, a fully fledged paper. And why is this the case? Well, obviously because of life, love, rock and roll and everything else in between. Um, but the real reason is even though I knew of uh, the existence of the set of photographs and the fact that it was used as evidence against a Chinaman, a certain Chinaman named Vin Chen. It actually took me about eight years to find the transcript of the court case. And like all my previous research, this particular, um, this particular project began while I was researching the conviction of Sheikh Ramtumaya and the letter we started this presentation with. Um, clearly all roads lead back to Ramthamaya. And so while wading through the attorney general files, I happened upon a somewhat dense and bulky envelope. Again, like I said, most bulky envelopes and dusty envelopes contain the greatest treasures. So all archival historians know this, that the best projects happen by chance and with some luck. Uh, but really by distraction and curiosity. So easily swayed by my inner voyeur, I carefully peeled away the seal flap and on the inside um, of this found a collection of photographs. Uh, again, suitably distracted by these images, I was both amazed, I was awestruck and perplexed by their placement in their record of the Attorney General files, but really intrigued by the story that lay beneath this collection. I quickly jotted down the reference and file description and search for attached documentation, uh, which was just a missive of some sort um, that would add some context to the pictures, but I really couldn't find anything more than that. So pressed for time um, to finish my MA thesis and dissertation at 
then uh, and with very, very strict instructions from my supervisor at the time, I was forbidden from doing any more archival research so that I could finish the writing process. Um, I created a new file on my laptop with whatever little information I had and simply labeled it as future research. Um, and I'm sure this is something you will all do at some point or another. So the MA was done. I moved on to the PhD, but these photographs constantly nagged me for attention. And searching through the NAIRS database again offered me absolutely nothing. The file that I had found in the AGO records itself was not indexed. So, so far, most of my research has come from unindexed and uncatalogued files. But I was really certain that there would definitely be a court case in the registers of the Supreme Court, because that's how the AGO, the Attorney General Office, and the Supreme Court worked. Or even if it wasn't the Supreme Court, that there would be some sort of hearing at the divisional or the magisterial level. I was wildly confident of this, simply because in the Natal legal system, the Attorney General's file contained all the evidentiary documentation that the state prosecutor needed and amassed for court cases. So I finished the MA, I finished the PhD, I started the postdoc, and then I was very successfully and suitably employed at WITS. And in August 2013, then, when I finally had a week free uh, from the shackles of first year teaching and all other teaching, I was able to re-immerse myself in archival research. I decided to order all five volumes, which doesn't seem like a lot, but it actually is, all five volumes of the Register of the Supreme Court indexes and carefully scrutinized every single entry on every line, desperately trying to find this case. But I could not. I gave up and then I left it to the side and I moved on to other research. But then later on, I decided to give the indexes one more chance. And finally, there it was, right? I finally found the case. And this was after about eight years of trying. So why had this entry uh, and this particular case been so elusive? It was simply because of the spelling of the name of the accused. In the AGO records where these photographs were contained, the accused name was spelt V-I-N space C-H-E-N, Vin Chen. But in the records of the Supreme Court, his name was changed to V-E-N, C-H-E-N, so Vin Chen. The elusive hunt for the Vin Chen case, which threw me off by a single letter. But this was only possible in finding it from knowing the guarded mechanics of the archival system, that the AGO case just had to be recorded somewhere and that I would find the reference to the case number by carefully combining through the indexes of the Attorney General's office. And so, I managed to find the court case, uh, which is quite interesting because one of the, one of the the girls that you see in the picture, Louise, is actually called up to give testimony in the case. Anyway, it's this, this, this project is still underway and it's still in draft form. So I now want to return to, if you can move to the next slide, please, Tembisa. I want to return to the first image that I used uh, starting this presentation, which you will see here is in its undoctored and raw form. Uh, this picture is taken from the original diary of a certain Muriel Payne, and it was written in the year 1900. So this is another project that I've been developing over the years. The caption reads that, um, believe it or not, a floor leaf clover from the Cliffdale area. I also found this diary by chance. I was very privileged um, to have been granted access to the strong rooms of the Peter Maritzburg archives. It's actually a longer story than that, but the short version is that I was eventually allowed, as were my archival buddies, allowed access to the holdings. Um, so, and I think it was partly out of frustration uh, because we would work through anything from 20 to 40 boxes a day. So uh, Mr. Nell, who some of you may know, he's the chief archivist in the PAR, or used to be, he suggested that it would actually just be easier for, for us to work in the holdings itself. So I went up to the fifth floor 
and found a table strewn with various types of uncatalogued boxes and documents. And among these, I found the diary of Muriel Payne. And I flipped through the pages and found this. And I immediately thought, oh my God, I was destined and blessed to always have good archival fortune because of this four-leaf clover. But on a more serious note, one day, and hopefully in the new in the near future, this paper on mural pain will be uh, completed. Because in this diary, it's the year of 1900, and her diary, it, in addition to her writings and her collection of uh, leaves and flowers, it offers a day-to-day -day account of the South African War in the year 1900. And at the same time, her entries also comment on the social and political vagaries of Natal life at the time. So. It was absolutely important to me in finding this and to think about a future project that would offer us again another view and another insight into colonial life. So this four-leaf clover then I think also bears some semblance to the uh, to the idea that archival research is sometimes maybe almost always about luck. Archival spaces are anything but neutral and as rewarding as archives can be, they can be equally frustrating, right? And if you speak to anyone who has done deep archival research, the one com comment I think that will always come up is that of dust, right? Dusty, smelly archives is a put off for many, but for me, it is the very factor that makes the research such a compelling activity. Not that I like to be covered in dust, but there's something about it. I recently um, read a Facebook comment where a well-established academic said Dusty Archives was in fact the re reason he didn't undertake any archival research and opted to become an oral historian. But anyway, different, different segue there. So when I first read then Carol Steedman's 2000 publication titled Dust, I immediately recognized myself and my research in the archives um, and those pages. Dust, she says, carries with it many metaphors. The archives are full of dust, dust of long gone eras and people, dust of the past, and out of this dust and the detritus of people's lives, historians construct meaning. So the archive then is a place in which the past manifests itself in this dust. And Steedman portrays the presence of history in the archives as dust that has come down from the past and that will never disappear. It collects, it settles between the cracks and it piles up very much like the way in which the archives have come to be. Steedman writes, the dust is the immutable, obdurate set of beliefs about the material world, past and present, inherited from the 19th century, with, itch, with, itch, with which modern history attempts to grapple. Dust is also the narrative principle of that writing and dust speaks. And so while this presentation is about luck, it's also about my encounters with dust and quite significantly the implication of this for social history. Apart from the physical materiality of dust, and for those of you that have already started working in colonial archives, I don't need to comment on the layers of dust you find yourselves covered in at the end of a long archival day. For many archival historians, dust is that abstract sense. It's about the search for what is not there, for what is barely visible, but at the same time, viscous and residual, and the dust which coats and which conceals, and no matter how well you have wielded, wielded that duster. So historical processes is also about revealing and layering, and so that which becomes apparent once the dust has been removed. And so my archive fever, and as pretentious as this may sound, the desire of finding things, artifacts, and records waiting to be discovered and rescued, it's not just about the cult or the seduction or the romance of the archives. It's really about the trajectory and the archival development and the layers of dust that have built up to my PhD project and beyond. But also it's about this ambivalent relationship with the archives over the years. Good archival work is about following the trail of evidence presented in bounded volumes and catalogs, index cards and search aids, and really then agonizing over scribbly handwritten letters, faded and bewildering photographs, or the myriad of other bits of parchment and paper. And while it has often been described as a lucky dip and the archives as a magical place, 
As historians, we need to remain cognizant of its complicated nature too, right? So in straddling that fine line between voyeurism and voice giving, we need to constantly remind ourselves to see through the layer of dust, but also to remind that as that to remind us that while at times we need to remove the dust, sometimes we need to probably sprinkle a little too. So the dusty spots can be significant and that hermeneutic dusting is itself complicated. Thank you. That brings me to the end. Thank you so much, Pranisha. That was fantastic. Um, you know, I'm thinking also as you are describing dust, um, you're making a very poignant um, and I think uh, heartfelt case for why archives matter. I'm thinking about ashes. I'm thinking exactly. about our colleagues at Especially, UCT and, um, and our colleagues all over the world who, 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 are, who use these archives and who value that dust. So thank you for that. Um, you. I'd like to open up the floor for questions. Um, I know that students often um, have questions. Uh, you're welcome to ask a question in a chat. I'm going to start with um, Gerald, uh, but please feel free to go ahead and write your message in a chat or put up your hand and I will call on you. Gerald, you can go ahead. I, can I just uh, say a big thumbs up to Natasha's comment also before Gerald yeah. uh, <laughs> yeah. goes ahead with his comment? Um, thank you very much, Prim. That was, as thank always, you. fantastic. Uh, I don't want to burst your bubble about dust. I know it's a lovely metaphor. <laughs> I have to wonder about the Natal archive because where I work, there is very little dust in the archive. But anyhow, <laughs> that's just a joke. Um, okay. Let me tell you another little joke about dust. Um, in the early 1910s, 20s, there was a debate between two scholars about the role of slaves in the origins of Afrikaans. And one of them wrote in one of his books, answering the other. He said, the answer may well be found in the archives, but one cannot expect a professor to filth his, to make his hands dirty with the dust of the archives. So it's a long, a long um, a history of people thinking that the archives are very dusty. But I actually want to ask you a serious um, question about methodology. So recently yes. I discussed with the the honest students, the question, uh, or we looked at ego documents. These are private records, people who are writing about themselves. And there is this debate mm. among scholars of ego documents where the court records should be considered ego documents. Now, mm. I'm of the opinion, working with the sort of stuff that I work from the 18th century, that um, that court records are too, they are, they're too fettered with power and uh, complicated relationship between the person doing the interrogation, the lawyers, the, the judges, yeah, yeah, and so on. So to, to really see court doc documents, even though they may use the first pronoun and talk about uh, lived experiences and things that happen to a person, I, I, I do really have my doubts whether you can see them as kind of giving an unfettered access to a person's mm -hmm. Um, uh, experience. So what I want to ask you is whether you've seen, given the range of people that you've worked on, you know, you've looked at indentured servants, but you've also looked at, at settlers, whether you can see that there is, or whether you can say something about this power relationship between the person who's giving testimony, who is telling the story, and that person's background, you know, in terms of race and class and power, and then how it is reflected in the court cases that or the documents that you read in the court cases. Sorry for a bit of a, a long-winded question. No, 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 I get it. Thank you. Thanks, Gerald. I think that's a very important question. So all much, much of my research has been with court records, and I always preface my um my my writing and my and my and my narratives by saying that what court records are able to offer is just a relative truth or a relative version of what actually transpired precisely for the re reasons you've laid out now about this power play and the interplay 
of positions in the civil service, specifically between magistrate, judge, and accused, alleged accused or prisoner. And I, I mean, it's just about being able to read between the grains and being able to read between the lines of the court transcripts uh, to be able to get at a version of what, of the events as they transpired. And so when using court records, I think historians should always be careful to use those in consultation with uh, other kinds of documents, uh, newspaper documents, private letters, uh, diaries if they are accessible, and very importantly, medical records that have also been used as evidence in the court cases. So absolutely, I think we've got to use them like all archival documents, right? With absolute care um, and some sort of, um, and, and, and just making sure that we use it caution, uh, cautiously um, to make sure that we're not preferencing one version of events over another. So yeah, I hope that answers part of your question. Okay. Thanks, Pranisha. I'm, I'm looking for other hands. I'm looking very, um, especially from students. I think this might, ref I, I see that Karen Jennings has her hand up. So uh, Karen, if you want to unmute. Uh, firstly, I want to say thank you. That was fascinating. I, I think, really. So, Karen, can you just tell me if you're an honor student or an MA student? And... A PhD student. A PhD student. Okay, good. Um, I really enjoyed that, and uh, my the thing that really, really excited me. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of. Um, yeah, I'm trembling at the excitement of the <laughs> the envelope that you found with the grass in it, uh, because I think th that in light of everything that's going on uh, lately and specifically with UCT in terms of the loss of archives and the need to digitize everything, but that kind of experience, that's something that you would lose and, and not be able to have that visceral reaction to that grass uh, falling out in, on your lap, to feeling that, and and also just the experience of something that was used to to do such harm, to mm. strangle a baby, and then there it is in your hands, and it's just this crumbly, powerless dust. Um, I think that's just an extraordinary experience, and it makes me want to rush out and and go to any archives I can find. <laughs> so I just wanted to to thank you very much for a wonderful um, talk and and for inspiring me. Thanks, Karen. Thank you for that. Um, you know, it's such it, this whole week. I think all of us have just been thinking about archives and the, the preciousness of archives and what they hold, especially as historians. But we've also been thinking about the future of archives, uh, how to invest in archives, and especially about the digitization process. And while preparing for the seminar, I just kept thinking, how do you digitize something like that, right? How do you actually, how do you, tr how are you able to transfer that kind of emotion that objects like that? that materiality of the archives are able to convey. Um, it's something that you can, you just cannot do through a browser. So thank you. I'm glad that you, you know, hopefully in your research, I mean, your PhD research, you are able to, uh, to have these kinds of experiences. Okay, I'm, I'm looking for more hands. I know that there were lots of questions around um, methodology in the last session. I see that uh, Professor Barnes is with us. Uh, Brendan, would you like to unmute and make your comment or ask your question? Yeah, thank you, Timbisa. Um, and thank you, Pranisha. This is wonderful. Um, <clears throat> I have a zero historical archive training. I'm actually uh. a psychologist um, researcher. Um, but in my spare time, <clears throat> I am very interested in historical work and especially how it shapes the context of how we think and behave currently. Um, but I, I have two quick questions, hopefully. I might have missed it, but the photograph of the, um, the young woman, um, what, can you give us just a little bit more detail about the case there? Um, and my second question really is about accessibility of the archives, especially the Peter Marisburg one, where yes. I've, uh, I've had some interaction with them, especially for people who, you know, I would call like amateur historians, not necessarily yes. Um, yes. researchers. Um, 
accessibility is a major, major problem. And, and any thoughts on improving that, um, you know, for the, the general public? Thank you very much. Thanks, Brendan. Can I just clarify which case you're referring to? The photograph the with, the, with the five... Uh, the five young women. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, okay, so Alex, it's, it's, I'm going to give you the descriptions. Let me just find it. The description for these cases. All right. So, um, I need to see my descriptions while I'm looking at it. So in the starting in the top left corner is Louise. So all of all the descriptions that I have for the photographs have been found on the back of it, right? It's been inscribed on the back. In the top right hand corner is Louise. It's simply titled Louise. Next to her is uh, Kitchen, right? This photograph has been titled Kitchen. Then next to her is piano. It's simply titled piano. In the bottom row, we have starting with mother, children, doorway. And then we have um, mother, children, doorway. Then the next one, I do the next one is mother, children, doorway. And then it's woman hat chair, and then it's girl sitting doorway. So woman hat chair, girl sitting doorway, and all of these inscriptions come from um, uh, come from the photographs himself. But Louise in the top left corner is the only one, despite her age, that is called to give testimony in the case. And Vin Chen himself was actually charged with uh, proliferating pon pornographic material. So I want to find the exact description of his court case. In, in 1906, uh, in the district, Durban and District Circuit Court, Vin Chen is charged with the crime of indecent assault. And indecent assault in this time period could mean many things. One, it could mean the circulation of material that were considered lewd or pornographic, but it could also refer to rape. And so going through the court cases in this instance, it wasn't uh, yeah. about, uh, it wasn't about rape or physical violence of that kind. He was specifically charged with contravening one of the sections of this, of this act, which was exhibiting indecent or lewd drawings or photographs likely to give offense to women. And he was eventually, eventually found guilty, um, uh, because of that. But there's yeah. a, you know, the case, the, the, my writing about this case is a little bit more, uh, complex than that, obviously, because it's also the ways in which Chinese people were particularly targeted um, by the state during this time period, right? About yellow peril, etc. The other young girl that is called to give evidence in this case is named Vina Grace, but she, I don't, I don't see any correlation to her in the photographs itself. Um, and she just describes in the court case how she was sitting on the swing uh, one side, uh, uh, outside her house one day. Uh, it was erected on the common grounds, I suppose. And apparently that uh, uh, Vin Chen uh, was um, playing with her and then he tried to pinch her on the stomach, but he tried to pinch her on her stomach by going through her clothing, through her undergarments. And this became, this event became the focus of the prosecution during the trial to actually charge him with the contravening uh, that particular clause of the, of the act, which was about exhibiting indecent or lewd drawings and photographs likely to give offense to women. And then related to your second question about accessibility to the archives, I'm not sure when you work there, but the archives did go through a period of renovations they're probably still renovating and this has been the case since 2003 2004 2005 um, and obviously has fallen victim to um, just state bureaucracy and poor management but I think regarding your question about accessibility maybe relates to the training and the quality of the archivists in the archives who have very little knowledge about the holdings and this is a serious problem because 
I don't think the archival and library information services do these archivists any justice. And what it's really entails is on the ground training with uh, archivists of and historians, maybe, maybe we need to be, be have a better hand at this, but they actually need to know how the records work, how the archive works, and how the different departments have actually come together to put these collections together. Oftentimes, you'll find, as I've tried to hint at, I think it's really about your personal relationship with the archives and figuring out for yourself how these archives work and how the different collections relate to each other, how the search aids work, um, how the indexes work, um, and how the different departments have actually collated their documents. So I do agree that it is a problem, um, you know, and it's something that just needs attention. We need, we need better trained archivists. That's, that's it, I think. Pranisha, I'm going to quickly uh summarize uh, just a few um, comments and questions that are coming through in the chat from uh, various people. Oh, so, right, I see this. Um, and I know that we're also running out of time. Um, oh, so yeah, I, yeah. maybe, I, maybe we great. can uh, put a number of questions together. I, Katleko wants to know just about what prompted your intensive interest in history, which I think is a, a great question. Um, and then uh, Prudence has a question about, you know, when you find a photograph in the archives, um, how do you set about analyzing uh, a photograph? And then um, I guess there's a question as to somebody who um, would like about to know the about how the, the latent case ended. Um, so... Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll just, respond I'll, very... And then we'll take a couple, we'll take Tiejo and um, I think Natasha had her hand up as well. Okay, so Katleko, <laughs> I like your question. Thank you. I think it's a very important question to ask historians, actually. But is there a specific area and situation that prompted your intense interest in history? And the answer is in grade, what would standard six be? Grade eight, I think. There was um, a worldwide tour about Anne Frank. And at that time, I was reading the diary of Anne Frank and I was completely enamored by her. And it was actually that. It was reading the diary of Anne Frank and going to an exhibition that the Holocaust Museum had put on in the Durban uh, Museum, the Central Museum. And I think it started from them. And then after that, we were given a task um, by our grade eight history teacher to do a project on any aspect of history. And I did my project on Steve Biko. So that was it. I think it started from there. There's more to the story, but I'll spare you, I'll spare you the time. When you go to the archives and find a picture instead of written records, how do you do a historical analyzed picture? I think you've got to be able to read in the context around it, right? So for instance, this picture of the Leighton family, you've got to think about Durban at the time in the turn of the century, about commercial tourism, about the onset of photography and why photography was so important during this time period, but also quite novel and the ways in which people wanted to capture a moment, the ways in which people dress. So you've got to read up about the style of dress and clothing during this time period. And then again, obviously, the relationship between the rickshaw uh, puller and the and the and the and his patrons, I suppose, and the way in which the rickshaw puller is presented in a very specific way, right? And that kind of commercial tourism still happens today. And so I think in, in, taming, in thinking about the context, you've got to be able to pull the picture apart and look at its various elements. And to be able to understand that, you've got to be able to read more broadly beyond the scope of what the picture is actually portraying. I hope that answers your question in some way. And then the Leighton family, yes, so all three were eventually accused. Uh, and charged with the crime of concealing the birth. Well, they, they were actually charged with the crime of murder, right? And then it was devolved to a crime of infanticide and concealment of birth because she was pregnant and gave birth to a baby. Uh, so she was concealing her birth and they were obviously found not guilty at the end. So it's more complicated because they were a white colonial settler family, etc., and they were obviously lent a helping hand by the colonial state. Okay, and Timbisa, do you want me to respond to Rafilwe's question as well? I think if you can briefly do that, yeah. I know that we started a bit late as well, but I know that yes. people have things, places they need to be, so, and I, I see that, Tiejo, uh, if, if I think I'm not sure I'm pronouncing the name right, um, maybe has a quick question as well. 
you can okay. unmute so, and ask your question. Sure. Uh, we feel we let me just quickly respond that I that I always say I like my people dead and in the archives because they can't talk back to us. <laughs> but no, I've always <laughs> I've always had an interest. I've always wanted to do uh, to do archival research. I think it's the it's just the the nostalgia for the past more than anything else. Diego? Yeah, uh, good afternoon. This is just a small quick question. Sure. Based on all the court cases that you have highlighted based on the indentured uh, Indian laborers and all of these cases in a nutshell, I just want to know that did they set a precedence in the sense that similar court cases that came after them was the ruling, it's the ruling that we gave, that was given, did it follow on the same route or the same course? Was it similar? Did it set a precedent in that future court cases were ruled along the same lines as those ones you highlighted? That is what I want to know. Thanks, Tiago. Not in those early years. Uh, certainly not in those early years. Each case was tried on its own merit. It's only from about the 1930s onwards that precedent cases are starting to be used more and more in the court system. Um, and you find that lawyers and magistrates make reference to earlier cases. But in the early years of the 1900s, not so much. Each case is definitely tried on its own. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Welcome. Thanks, Pranisha. I think that there was just, um, if you want to just reiterate your um, conclusion about what happened to the Leightons, and I know that in your, in your dissertation, you talked a lot about, um, you know, race and class and all of that in, in the outcomes of these trials, and I think the Leighton case was, was one of those. Yeah, I mean, the Leightons, they just so, they just, you know, they, 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 some of your historical subjects that just stay with you uh, right up until the end. And I think a lot of people have found this case interesting precisely because of the overwhelming evidence around the case and the ways in which then they were tried by the Natal courts and the kinds of leniency that was meted out to them by the court system. I mean, so the hotel that they stayed in found these bloodied sheets um, and um, yeah, found the bloodied sheets. They had found other kinds of materials that was uh, laced with blood. Um, and, you know, and people, and, and, and people knew that they would be found, could, could well have been found guilty of infanticide, but they just weren't. And the ways in which it attracted um, the law, the, the sorry, the media was just astound astounding. So the Leighton family, um, you know, it provides us, I think, with a commentary about the legal procedures, but in, also investigative methods used in criminal cases in the Tal during this time. Um, and it also, you know, gives us a glimpse into the ways in which white Natal colonials also felt a degree of entitlement during this time. So, you know, the day that the Leighton family and his daughters left for Pretoria uh, at the Fern Villa Hotel, one of the daughters had actually been seen carrying with this traveling rug. Remember I said that the rug or carpet had also been used as evidence and, um, at the Durban station, one of the ticket collectors also notices that Rose had looked very ill um, and she held with her a hat box and some wraps. And so all of this kinds of, was the baby in the rug? Was the body of the baby in the hat box? But all of these kinds of evidence was just simply discarded. Um, you know, she, at some point on the train journey, she also leaves to go to the lavatory and she goes for a long time. The father tries to wonder why she does this, but it really doesn't, um, it doesn't come to any fruition. So it was actually an Indian, um, a plate layer who found the body of the baby, the naked baby. He found a piece of cloth um, around its neck again. So perhaps they had strangled the baby. I'm not sure. They also found bloodied paper lying next to uh, the body. So it was quite a complicated case. And there was such overwhelming evidence for all of this. There was even a medical postmortem, a medical, sorry, not a postmortem, a medical examination done of Rose um, to see if she had recently been given birth, etc. And all of that actually pointed to the fact that she may have been pregnant. Um, but eventually the case was dismissed and 
um, you know, I, I want to read to you a bit from the closing statement. Um, she, she, he says that if, um, if he had said anything strong in the prosecution's opening statement, it was not his fault. He was bound to admit that despite the evidence presented by the witness in, in, in regard to the alleged condition of the girl, Rose Layton, it was still entirely unsatisfactory. And so, you know, it was so that the evidence would have to be taken in conjunction with the circumstances of the case. Um, and despite, again, like the medical evidence, I say, he commented that a verdict, the, the judge at the time, I think it was Henry Bale, I can't remember, but he commented that a verdict of concealment of birth could not be returned because they had no jurisdiction to where the child was allegedly placed and because the body of the child had not been concealed, right? So any passengers from the train could see the body, he said, and uh, the prosecutor's argument pointed out that there was no evidence that Rose had in fact give birth to the child at Fern Villa, and second, that there was no evidence that the body of the child found on the railway line had been alive when it was born. So remember at the start of the presentation, I talked about proving a live birth and a separate birth, that was it. So there was no proof that the child found was actually the child or the boy son of Rose. So for all of these uh, reasons, the case was dismissed, but it was also about jurisdiction. So because um, the, the, the case was tried outside of the jurisdiction of the court system, it had to be dismissed, dismissed and they were found not guilty. So that's very briefly what happens to the case. But if anybody wants to read it in detail, I'd be happy, happy to share the uh, court case. Well, thank you, Pranisha. I think we're going to have to end as much as I think many of us would like to just continue talking about these cases and archives <laughs> and all of that. Uh, research junkies. So exactly. Um, exactly. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Um, and Thank you for giving me this opportunity. It's been so good. I hope you guys as students really taken something away from this, except, you know, the absolute love and um, I think the excitement that we have for the archives. So I hope this inspires you in some way. Not that I want to be <laughs> inspirational, but I hope it just excites you in some way or another. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Goodbye for now. And we'll see guys. you next Bye. month for another seminar. Thank Thanks you. Again, uh, please Patricia. invite me. I do want to come to the next one. So please okay, we'll me. definitely do that. Okay, All right. Take Thank care. you. Thanks, Lisa. Okay. Bye. Bye.